you have great potential. And that just puts lots of pressure and expectation on someone without the support. Whereas how I like to see it is I, I can say to you, I think you could do something great, but I'm going to help you to get there. I'm going to be here with you. I'm going to support you. And that for me is that's a winning environment. So welcome back to the Pathway podcast. And I'm really honored this week to have Olympic 400 meter hurdler Jack Green joining us. Now, Jack competed at London 2012 Olympics and then fell during the semifinals of that race. And he had to deal afterwards with the fallout of that and struggling with his mental health for a number of years. And he made a comeback to compete at another Olympics in Rio 2016 to win medals in the 4x400 meters at World Championships, European Championships, Commonwealth Games. So he's got a really interesting backstory. And in this interview, he's really open and it's really candid conversation about what he went through as an athlete, how he picked himself up, and he gives some really great advice on how we can work with our students to build a really healthy relationship with performance. So I really hope you enjoy the conversation as much as I did. And don't forget to subscribe to be the first to hear our next podcast. Jack, welcome to the Pathways podcast. And as always, your first question comes from our previous guest, who was Nigel Green. Um, and Nigel is thinking about the benefits of being physically active uh, and more specifically about the inner development goals and how taking a holistic view of physical activity can encourage people to live more sustainable lives. So his first question to you is, what are the psychological characteristics that we should be looking to develop through physical education and sport? It's a great question and will be far greater than whatever I end up coming up with. But you've got standard buzzwords around resilience and growth mindset and so on. But I think a huge lesson that we can start teaching our young people and, and through sport is that trying isn't a dirty word and, and trying is really positive, that that's all we can do. So I'm very passionate around measuring on effort rather than results for example when I coach young kids I, I typically I coach obviously elite athletes but when I, I coach younger athletes it's all around taking away the time I won't use a stopwatch because I want them to just try and feel everything and be a present and in the moment so obviously as I said those buzzwords of resilience growth mindset kind of overcoming that fear of failure which for me ties into trying so it's all stuff we know but yeah, I think we can develop people beyond sport by using sport. What an amazing you know, vessel to be able to support people. I mean, I think it's an interesting start, actually, because we're talking about all these buzzwords, resilience and, and this fear of failure. And I think lots of people understand that within sport, we have the highs and lows. People talk about the highs and lows of sport. And I don't think they really understand how high the highs can be and how low the lows can be. And I think of anyone I know, any sports person I know, yours is probably the biggest distance between the highs and the lows, given that you competed at London 2012, which must have been an unbelievable experience, something we were all trying to achieve. And yet, because it didn't quite go how you hoped it to go, you then had to suffer the consequences of that afterwards. So maybe you could tell us a little bit about your your London 2012 experience and, and how that was for you. I actually have very few memories of London 2012, probably some element of blocking it out in, in some degree, but also because you just get so focused and so blinkered on performance that it's everything else is a distraction and you don't really take it in. You know, you're only present in terms of how am I going to go and, and perform and, and, and run. So all I can tell you about London 2012, apart from the fact it was epic and, you know, I'd gone from two years before just doing a BTEC at school and going in twice a week to and being like 105th in the world when two years before to then suddenly I was top 10 in the world and in front of 80,000 people but all I can tell you is that I was full of fear I just all that's all the only memory I have is I was scared and I didn't want to be there uh, which is really sad because I've been writing stories about going to the Olympics from the age of seven when I first found out at primary school that I could run fast and I liked winning and being praised right and yet, because of all of that, because of the amount of pressure and expectation I put upon myself as well as externally, I just didn't want to be there because it was 
kind of so much to lose in my mind and it was almost like if I don't perform then has this all been worth it am I really who I say I am am I who everyone else thinks I am and yeah I ended up just not performing so I I went into the semi-final I got to the third hurdle which isn't very far around and I hit that hurdle and I fell and I still have scars on my knees uh, of where the, the track took the skin off my knees so that's a nice reminder and yeah that was my first olympic experience and actually the time i ran two weeks beforehand at the crystal palace diamond league would have made me the youngest olympic finalist in history um and then two people i beat by quite a margin two weeks beforehand ended up being olympic gold and silver medalists and as a young man with a lack of failure a lack of experience a lack of emotional intelligence that was a really hard thing to take um and then a few days later I went into the relay ran it I ran very well probably the best I've ever run in my life and we ended up finishing fourth and I missed a medal by 0.13 of a second and it kind of felt like lightning had struck twice and yeah that was my first uh kind of Olympic experience but my first real experience of of a major failure and one that questioned my identity and myself and as she said, there was some there's lows after that. And I was diagnosed with um, depression, bipolar tendencies, generalized anxiety disorder. I was considered a threat to my own life, all at the point that I was top ten in the world, and um, finished fourth at the Olympics. And I'm 20 years old, and you think that's not how this should go. Now, just want to put a little disclaimer: the Olympics aren't the reason why I was diagnosed with mental health disorders. They were a trigger. I definitely struggled as a as a child with anxiety and perfectionism and a fear of failure but I'd always kind of masked that with success so it was never seen as an issue because I was always successful but then I went to what is the gates of of heaven the pearly gates and I wasn't up to the the challenge and I wasn't worthy which 100% was right I was never going to win those Olympics wasn't good enough but I didn't see it as an opportunity to learn and grow to then try and win the next one and the next one and to keep moving forward and to develop. I was a all or nothing, black or white. So yeah, really long explanation there for you, but hopefully there's a lot in there because I think it's important, particularly when we're talking about coaching young people and supporting young people, I think there's a lot to experience and learn from that story because I was 20 years old, I was still a kid. It sounds like you, from a very young age, identified as being an athlete and being in that environment really is a test of that identity. Um, so when it when it doesn't go as you hoped, it's almost like what are you left with when you are an athlete? But the really interesting thing for me was that you came back, like, as you said, to run in the four by four. And I remember you running something like 44 low or something, which is is was is an unbelievable time anyway. But for a 20-year-old to run is ridiculous and to come fourth place in in the four by four how did you pick yourself up from your huge disappointment and that and that identity bubble bursting after the four hurdles how did you pick yourself up to come back and run the relay so well the thing is i actually had a so much negativity so much embarrassment and shame that i use that really positively and that's the thing, we can use these negative experiences really well to to really boost in, uh, kind of that intensity. But the problem with anything negative is it is like poison. You just can't hold on to it for too long. But holding on to it for that one race or those two races, the heats in the final, that's a that's a fine amount of time to do it. Problem was, I couldn't move on from that. And I so that was my opportunity then to be like in that those heats to show that I was worthy and and just go out and do what I do best, which is just run, which I'd actually stopped myself doing in the in the hurdles because I was so full of fear that I didn't just let myself be me. So I went into those relays with a point to prove, right? And yeah, I think that shame and embarrassment was my fuel that ended up really pushing me forwards. Um, and yeah, I ran phenomenally. Like I think I ran the fastest split by anyone in the world in those heats. And then I... And I'm a hurdler as well. Like you don't see many hurdlers transferring over, but I had the speed to do so. And then, yeah, the final, we, we missed out on a medal and I ran another 44 on a really difficult leg in that. So back to back. And you think there was so much goodness there, so much positive, but I could never see it because my whole life was about how do I become an Olympic champion? So I spent every single day of my life as a failure. And that got me to the top really, really quickly. But it didn't keep me there because it was a huge negative to spend my life as a failure and always not being enough and not being good enough and not being very nice to myself. 
and that's where I talk about sustainable performance, sustainable winning a lot of like, well, sport is unhealthy, like elite sport. Exercise is great. Recreational sport is great. But elite sport is unhealthy. It's not about making it healthier, but can we make it better? Uh, sorry, it is about making it healthier. Uh, it's not about making it healthy. Can we make it better and healthier? Yes, we can. And that's where I've then done that with athletes. And I wish I knew that, known that myself. But I came from environments that were very old school just brutal you're a 400 hurdler and i was known for being strong like no one can out train me and no one can beat me in the last 100 meters of a race so that also attached to my identity that i was able to endure everything and i was resi more resilient than anyone else when actually inside i wasn't not emotionally i was incredibly insecure and you'll have known me when i was young as well i think prior to those olympics i was incredibly arrogant through insecurity i was incredibly aggressive because i thought that's how i had to be i wasn't particularly a nice person i was really but i played up to this idea of who i was meant to be and what sports meant to be it's it's uh i i can identify with it really well because obviously i was also aiming for the same goal i was aiming for london 2012 i had never thought i was gonna be a medalist but i i went through a phase of i'd won a bronze at the commonwealth games two years beforehand so then everybody around me not only assumed that I was going to go to the Olympics but they they thought I was going to win a medal and I spoke at a conference recently and I, and I I kind of explained that my mindset went from this going into Commonwealth Games I'm going to go to Commonwealth Games I'm going to win a medal to well everyone's expecting me to I hope I can and it sounds like you went through a similar kind of journey with yours in that my identity is I'm a 400 meter hurdler. I'm going to be an Olympic champion. And then you get on the track and suddenly phew, I hope I can live up to my, my own expectations as much as anyone else's. So it's really tough. But I know, I know after that, you then took some time off of the track to kind of recover from, from that experience. What, what did you do during that time to, to make a, to make a recovery? Because you came back four years later to go to the next Olympics. What was that recovery process like for you? Um, I still trained quite a bit because I didn't know I could do anything else. I did a bit of coaching. Um, I drank and ate and tried to be a, a very much a normal person, right? Because I was very intense of not doing anything that was fun or enjoyment. I always took fun and enjoyment out. That wasn't part of what we do. You're not here to have fun. You're here to win. So I tried to do that. And all that happened was I took myself away from sport for 18 months. And I didn't know how long it would be at the time that I took myself away for. It ended up being 18 months. And I felt better because I didn't have pressure and expectation. But I didn't, I just kind of left it at that. I was like, cool, I feel better. Done. So I kind of saw it like an injury rather than this is something, why do I react in certain ways? Why do I think this way? And how do I keep managing myself? What are my triggers and what are the things that give me positivity and help me and boost my capacity? And said, I just went, cool, I feel better, I'm done. And then I got a phone call from uh, Lauren Seagrave out in Florida at IMG Academy at the time. And he had coached world record holders in my event, Olympic champions in pretty much every event. He's a, a genius. Um, and he just said, oh, if you want to come back and run, I'd love to coach you. So I moved out to Florida uh, after 18 months. Well, a year I moved out and uh, I only returned to sport because of that identity thing. Because I didn't know it could be anything else. I didn't know that at the time. But the easiest decision to, to make at that point was I just run again. You mean you came back four years later though for a phenomenal career you went to another olympics in rio 2016 you you won a, a medal at the europeans in 2016 and a medal at the world championships in 2017 mm -hmm. stepping back into that environment how did you cope with the pressure especially knowing that in an event like four hurdles such a tiny mistake has such huge consequences how did you cope with the pressure walking back into that same environment again it was a really hard environment um because I've gone so public with my mental health, and I think when you think about it, this was 11 years ago, it really wasn't understood. And I think I was seen as different. And I think I was seen as damaged goods. I'm quite, I'm quite happy to say that. I think I wasn't particularly made welcome. So then I coached myself for five years of my career on my at Ashford and Canterbury tracks, where I started as a kid in Kent. And there was less pressure because with everything that was going on and how much I was struggling outside of sport and the fact that I didn't have enough money, I was working three part-time jobs, keynote speaking to fund my career. I was coaching myself, I was training on my own. And then I retired at 28 when actually I was a very good athlete and I could have been really, I know everyone says it, but I did all of that 
with really difficult circumstances and that's why the pressure changed because I almost didn't expect much from myself at that point I always believed in myself but the pressure was different because I just thought with everything going on just just give it a go and see what happens rather than 2012 where it was like you have to be great when we're looking at PE and we're trying to look at this more holistic view of it we're often talking about the psychological traits that we want to develop in our students through sport and I think you portray so many of those um, probably because you've had this difficult uh, career they're almost exacerbated um, and they're maybe they're a bit more at the forefront where we can see them but I mean one of the ones everyone's always talking about is is how do we build resilience and I think that's probably one of your strongest traits is can you still performed at the highest level with all those issues in the background and coaching yourself so what what I mean what does resilience mean to you and and what do you think um, role resilience played in your career? We talk about resilience a lot and we just see resilience in terms of a definition as just like overcoming difficult things and keep pushing forward. But I think that's just stupid resilience because not everything has to be overcome and not everything has to be endured. I was rewarded from day one in my life because I had a, a very difficult upbringing as well in terms of um, it's just me and my mum and, and bouncing around council flats and so on and no money and things. And I was really good at enduring. Then I went into a sport and an event where everything is about enduring. So I was constantly rewarded for enduring things that I thought I had to endure everything. That I thought life had to be difficult. That I thought things weren't ever meant to be easy. And if they were, then it's not right. It's not true. And I think we do that in society as well. And actually, I think the the intelligent resilience I would like to teach people and, and work with them on is like not everything has to be endured and not everything has to hurt. Whereas I think we create resilience in this bit of like, well, you just have to get on with everything. You don't something you know, enduring or 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 going through suffering for suffering's sake is just masochistic, right? It's it's just stupid. And that's the thing, I would just try and endure everything. And then I'd end up in this place where my capacity is zero and I can't endure anymore. Instead of being smart about where should I put my energy and my efforts and my my resilience. So that's a roundabout way of answering the question, but hopefully that helps. No, sure, I, I get that. It sounds like resilience for you, it's more of just an in, ingrained trait that you've developed rather than something that you think you've developed over time. And it, it sounds maybe like, your strongest trait is maybe more your work ethic as a result of your of your resilience. Do, would you say that's true? Yeah, but like anything, I talk about this from the things that make me really, really good um, are also the things that push me over the edge because I don't always manage them. So we can talk about, great, you're resilient, but are you trying to endure everything? Uh, we can talk about work ethic and it's like, yeah, but sometimes it's the smartest thing is to not work right having those moments of recovery and and training smart so my first professional environment in athletics was with malcolm arnold who coached colin jackson john akibua di green and he he's a brutal coach in terms of his training programs are hard like you will do four years worth of training in a year and if you survive it you're going to be great if you <laughs> if you survive it right so he taught me how to work hard and then i went to lauren seagrave in florida who was like just quality, just science. Like if it's under 20 degrees, you don't run. It's like I'd never run in the UK, um, like once a year, um, if that was the case. And it was all just quality and focusing on that. So he taught me how to work smart. And I think the blend between the two is actually the is is where the gold is. So you said that um we don't have to try and overcome every obstacle. Um so so where do you see goals within within sport, within within training especially i'm thinking about our younger students that have these big goals they they want to some of them want to be olympic athletes some of them just want to enjoy the game and get better how do we set goals um that are healthy that, that don't become this blocker to performance or this or this lead down that mental health route i don't think there's any harm in having really really big goals you can say i want to be olympic champion like never put anyone's fire out right if someone says i want to be olympic champion great but then i think it's just a case of like okay, you want to be Olympic champion, let's reverse engineer, engineer that. What does it take to get there? Because then we create this pathway 
instead of how I work and how many work, which is just, well, I'm going to be an Olympic champion. And then never ask myself, like, how am I going to get there? Or what does it take? Or how long does that take? Or any of the, you know, the the details to it, which meant that then when I experienced some of those steps on the journey, I wasn't either expecting them or I didn't like them. Uh, this is, I'm not Olympic champion. Instead of being like, well, to be Olympic champion, first I need to become a county medalist and then a county, you know, and just go through and have, whether it's that or, or, or more feeling and various other stuff and, and try and, for me, it's just how do we break it down into really small parts to get this understanding so that we can always start finding small wins and keep moving forward rather than, well, unless I'm an Olympic champion, I'm a failure, as I used to look at it. Uh, and and that just keeps you in the moment and it keeps you moving forward and it uses far more positive kind of feelings and, and environments to get us where we want to be. But I think you learn more in that process as well because you can also build in the fact, if I said to you as a as an athlete, will you ever get injured? You'd go, obviously. But no one ever really asks you that question. And then when an injury comes along, it's like the end of the world and the biggest thing. But why is it the end of the world and the biggest thing? We knew it was going to happen at some point. So this is now an opportunity. Not only did I know about it, but that means I prepared and planned for it in some capacity. Now I can learn and move forward. And I kind of see that with goals as well. Will you fail at some point on the way to becoming an Olympic champion? Yes. Okay, so why is it a problem when? when it happens then well it's not now because i know it's it's part of my journey i didn't know that was part of my journey um so yeah i'm very big on how do we reverse engineer and find small wins along the way and then on top of that and, and particularly as we're talking about schools and, and young people we talk about potential a lot and i hate the word potential when it's used in, in typically the ways i see it in, in both in school environments that i've worked in and and in, in professional environments you have great potential and that just puts lots of pressure and expectation on someone without the support. Whereas how I like to see it is I, I can say to you, I think you could do something great, but I'm going to help you to get there. I'm going to be here with you. I'm going to support you. And that for me is that's a winning environment. Not only are we encouraging people, but then we're saying that we are here as safety, which I think isn't done enough of in particularly with our young people. I mean, I think addressing this fear of failure is a really important aspect of, of sport because especially we know that if you want to be good at something, it means you need to fail 50 times, 100 times, 1,000 times more than anyone else so you can work out what's right. So, that, I mean, when I was coaching in Aspire, I had a, an ethos of I'm going to cheer for people twice as much when they make a mistake as when they are successful because I know that they're trying something new they've not tried before and that's how we create success in the future but i know you i mean you were a terrible self-critic during your career how's your relationship with failure now better but i still don't like it but i think that's something that we have to move past of like it's good not to like it but greatness success is kind of on that edge of like i've got to take a risk here and that risk might mean that i'll look stupid i'll get it wrong i'll fail but it also might mean that I achieve what I want to achieve. And that's the thing I was struggling with because I was so, so fearful of failure. I wouldn't take risks. And that's a big reason why I probably wasn't as good as I could have been because I wouldn't take a risk. I'd rather stay safe because I worried about, I thought getting it wrong was bigger than potentially getting it right. And that's why I said at the start, like, can we encourage people to think of trying as a positive word rather than this dirty word that we kind of laugh, oh, you tried. And it's like, well, that's all you can do. Like, that's the start of it. And through trying, you might get it wrong, but you also might get it right. I mean, these are really great words for some of our youth athletes to hear, to almost to give them permission to, to try. Um, and I think a lot of students need permission to try, given that they're worried their peers are going to laugh at them um, for trying, let alone for failing. Um, but I know you, I mean, you're doing a huge amount of work at the moment now with with uh, youth uh, mental well-being and youth sport as well. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about some of the work you're doing. Um, you touched on it a little bit earlier, but I know you've got such a such a huge network now. So, yeah, I work within sports teams in particular at the moment, professional sports teams, uh, mainly, um, as well as all my coaching work within youth sports. But, yeah, and it's just how do we identify 
and protect the players and, and athletes around what happens off the field or the track or whatever surface they play on. So mental health, financial well-being, social media, their relationships with friends and family, their opinion on culture and leadership, their opinion on their own performance, their mindset. And actually the 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 biggest stresses that we see are social media the use of social media and the impact that it has on an individual I, I do a lot of work within football at the moment so that's very big for football and you wouldn't catch me on social media if I was a footballer I can tell you that um but relationships with friends and family is always in the top three as well as financial well-being I think that's really interesting that those are the three that come up um and then how are we thinking about that with our young athletes and progressing through? Because like anything, let's let's be proactive and preventative and let's build great habits and mindsets and behaviours early so we don't have to pick up broken people down the line. So that's essentially what, what we're doing is we're having to fix broken people when we can get it right early doors. Um, and then we just get more people coming through that funnel who, not about winning Olympics or, or so on, but just more content and healthier and that leads to success in whatever they choose anyway i mean you said earlier about how it wasn't the olympics that caused your mental health issues it was a trigger um and i think i think i you you said about your behaviors when you were young you're very angry and a, a little bit neurotic maybe and and i think when i look back i can see that now at the time, you might just think, well, this Jack Green, he's a bit of a sport brat who doesn't like losing. Is I mean, but now we look in hindsight, we can see actually this was uh, an indicator of what was lying under the surface maybe. So how, how could our teachers kind of identify students that might be struggling with these kind of issues? Yeah, it's a great question because obviously varies for every individual but i think communication is key to everything right interpersonal relationships are, are so important and, and particularly within school environments and particularly within sport now what questions are we asking how are we showing that we value people beyond just their performance because that's where you get those conversations then being honest truthful ones right and this can start from as you said how are we giving permission and how we role modeling through our own actions and behaviors, whether that is showing that we're not afraid to fail, that we're just human beings, right? I'm very horizontal relationships rather than vertical that we can get within coaching, teaching environments. How are we on the same playing field that we can connect? But yeah, how many questions are we asking? Are we actually valuing what happens outside of their sport? Are we asking how anything else is going and showing that they are more than just the athlete that you work with and, I think that's then when we can start to learn about those people, but they start to take down that guard or that idea or that mask of who they're meant to be. And that's where we can start to really look at the deeper picture. Whereas, yeah, I just wore a mask the whole time. As I said, success papered over the cracks. So no one actually asked me how I was because they just went, well, Jack must be fine. They presumed and assumed I would be fine because I was winning. But winning was just something that was happening and actually was quite separate to me as a human being. Actually, I was really struggling and I, and no one ever asked me. Um, and yeah, sometimes you have to ask twice and sometimes you have to keep asking and you just have to be consistent and you learn people down the line. But yeah, I've, I know it sounds a bit of a cop out of an answer, but that's the thing with well-being and with a lot of culture and performance stuff is it's really simple stuff that just isn't done. And it is, are you asking your people how they are? That's something I've even brought into the, like huge corporations where it's like, does anyone actually know how their people are? No, because we've never asked, because we only care about numbers. Let's not do that with sport as well. So we're looking at the person before we're looking at the performance. But for those that are pursuing performance, our students that want to be higher level athletes or those that care about the outcome and they care about winning, how can we build a healthy relationship for them with performance? Yeah, I think really, really important that we we look at the identity we spoke about earlier. You are more than just your performance, but that doesn't mean it doesn't matter, right? And I think I have no problem with people not liking losing. In fact, I love it, right? Cool. It means something, right? You don't like losing, but it's what we do after it. I lost and 
right? What's the what's the story beyond your performance? So you can be content in the moment. You can say, this is where I'm at. Whether I like it or not, this is who I am right now. And this is what my performance is. But what am I going to do about it? And what next? I think that's the real key way to start creating a healthy relationship with performance is my results are a part of me, but they're not completely me. And I'm actually really content with who I am right now. Or you might not be, but you, I'm content with where I am or I have to accept where I am. But what I won't accept is learning how to keep moving forward and how to keep developing and progressing. That's where we start to get a really healthy way of how do I drive myself and, and keep performing and pushing forward without it just being like, I'm not good enough, I'm not worthy, and really negative self-talk that will end up burning you out or breaking you. I mean, I think, again, amazing advice for any young athletes that are looking for performance that, okay, we the pursuing performance is okay. It's It's a positive thing to do. It's going to build all these traits through the pursuit of performance. But it's that's not who you are. That's not your identity. You're still a person underneath. Winning and losing is a part of that journey. Injuries is a part of that journey. And understanding that maybe that's what the true performance mindset is. It's it's understanding the journey and enjoying the journey as we pursue, uh, pursue that high level performance. So, I mean, amazing advice, I think, um, coming from your experience as an athlete. We want to give you something back as well, um, which is when we have our next guest, we'd like them to ask answer a question that comes from you. So is there something that you're thinking about within your realm, within sport, within coaching at the moment that you think our next guest, whoever they might be, could possibly offer some insights into? I think it's along the lines of, and this is just a question that I get asked, and I think it's a challenging question in, in the environment that we're in. Can you be successful without unhealthy and difficult behaviors? And I'm just really interested in what people, how people view that and what perspective. And you can build that out however you want, Martin, on that, because I think there are other avenues you can go down to or, or better ways of questioning it. But essentially, like, do we have to destroy people? to get to success amazing question so jack thanks a lot for coming on the pathways podcast really interesting really interesting conversation i think for me and and anyone listening so really appreciate you coming on thanks for having me